Why is there so much killing in games? The murder of virtual people seems like the one thing everyone knows about video games. In fact, if you went by the sheer amount of news media, you'd think that killing was the only thing that video games were about. It is 360 degrees of murder and mayhem. But while people still debate whether video games make you violent or not, which, come on, they don't. Homicide and crime rates have been declining in America ever since the 1990s, coincidentally around the same time that Doom rose to prominence. We've talked before about why villains Recognizing video games for their violence is somewhat of a double standard. But today, let's try to put aside the moral perspective on violence in games and instead take a closer look at killing as a mechanic. Because let's be honest, there's a lot of virtual death in games, and it goes way beyond just shooters. I mean, you could even consider Mario a mass murderer if Nintendo didn't keep cloaking his evil deeds in cat suits and clouds with eyes. So why is there so much killing in games? And could there be an explanation for why it's such a fundamental part of the medium? Well, first of all, we should remember that excessive murder isn't exclusive to games. For example, in the show 24, Jack Bauer has killed 309 people in nine seasons. That's 309 people he murdered in just nine days. If I wanted to kill you, you'd be dead by now. You can't even call Game of Thrones revolutionary for killing off so many of its main characters. Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus in the Spirit of the Greeks has 14 deaths in just five acts. That's five more than Game of Thrones ever managed in a whole season. That's because conflict is essential to narrative. You literally can't have a plot without it. And when it comes to stories that require a visceral impact, like say for players of a video game or a theater full of people who must know the dire consequences of one man's hubris, one of the easiest ways to raise the stakes is to make it about life and death. As Alfred Hitchcock said, drama is life with the dull parts left out. So as long as video games are devices for stories, we can expect a certain amount of bloodshed. But games are different. They haven't always incorporated narrative, yet they've been about eliminating enemies long before the first person shooter was even invented. We euphemistically call it capturing in chess, but make no mistake, you're playing a war simulator where your own the objective is to eliminate your enemy. When we spoke with NYU Game Center professor Charles Pratt, he traced the language of life and death in video games all the way back to pinball. As the precursor to arcade games, pinball was the first to establish the concept of having lives. What was abstract death in pinball became kill or be killed in the arcade games that followed like Space Invaders. Then as video games developed through time, the convention of kill or be killed became almost like a shorthand for game designers. Bioshock Infinite creator Ken Levine, who's often accused of including an unnecessary amount of combat in his games, admitted in an interview that shooters answer a lot of questions for designers. He said very succinctly, the main mechanic is you have a gun, you have weapons, you have enemies, and you have conflict coming right at you. And as it turns out, as human beings, we're instinctually attracted to these simple extremes. Researchers Scott Rigby and Richard Ryan say that a huge part of the satisfaction we get from shooters derives from what psychologists call self-determination theory. The theory says that people are motivated to engage in activities in order to satisfy three basic psychological needs. The feeling of competence and power through skill building, maintaining autonomy, and being important to other people. Shooters provide a great context for designers to engage these fundamental motivations. Gruesome kills are effective visual cues to denote mastery and make us feel powerful. We exercise autonomy every time we decide which strategic path or where to take cover before an encounter. And finally, many shooters justify excessive killing through story. More often than not, it's by framing the player as a hero a psychopathic, horrifying hero. But perhaps the most compelling rationale for all that violence is that video games are software, in essence, a world made up of a bunch of ones and zeros. To an extent, binary code communicates human experiences the best when they are simple, on-off situations, like, you know, winning and losing, living or dying. And let's not forget that life and death is one of the most easily accessible metaphors to people of all ages. Game over is as blunt and direct as anything you can 
imagine, or perhaps you prefer you are dead. But the fact that video games communicate these simple on-off, dead or alive situations doesn't make them uncomplicated. Being a complex piece of artwork simultaneously made up of the most simple forms of communication is part of their beauty and appeal. In the end though, I do think that there are other types of games and play styles we'd benefit from exploring more, outside the realm of killing and competition. I think games will grow beyond mindless killing as they grow alongside us, and we as a culture start valuing more qualities outside of competition. The fact that a cooperative game like Journey won Game of the Year in 2013 is evidence that we're ready and hungry for different types of play. And we should remember that video games are a young medium. You might even say that they're still in the Greek tragedy phase of their evolution. So what do you think? Is killing a fundamental part of games, or do you think that games will evolve past the blood and guts? Hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. Last week we talked about Minecraft's use of procedural generation for world building. Let's see what you had to say. One quick amendment before we get into the comments. When I asked about whether or not procedural generation should be used in games, we should be really clear about the distinction between um, procedural generation being used by game designers to create things like terrain or allowing small teams to um, dictate loot drops or any types of things that are generated by computers versus procedural generation as a genre of games. So like a Minecraft, for example, any of these like big open world games that are, you know, endless quote unquote. So I really think a lot of you are talking about about, um, the latter category, about procedural generation as a genre of games. But it should be clear that, yeah, procedural generation is used by lots and lots of game designers, even in uh, genre, in games that wouldn't necessarily be described as procedurally generated games. Rockman-12 doesn't really like the idea of procedural generation as a genre being the dominant form of the types of games that we play, specifically as it relates to story. Um, this person points out visual novels, for example, which uh, may have more linearity, more intentionality in terms of the story that's going to be told. However, I could see a world in which um, procedural generation or procedurally generated stories could really enhance an experience like The Walking Dead or Tales from Borderlands, where you have all these discrete decisions that lead to some type of, um, I don't know, computer generated outcome that's totally different for everyone. But as someone who writes myself, I can understand the desire to want to hold on to um, some level of having a strict beginning and end to a particular story. Terminal Hunter makes an excellent point, which is that procedurally generated games aren't just fun for players, but they're really fun for the creators as well. It's kind of like raising a child in the sense that, you know, that child is going to surprise you, delight you in ways that you couldn't have expected. So when Warren Spector was talking about um, these types of games, Minecraft and whatnot, as being engines of perpetual novelty, he could have been talking about the player, but he just as easily could have been talking about the creator. Archmage Omega left a nice, long, and meaty comment. You all should do the same. There was one portion of Archmage's comment that I wanted to address, um, which is something we didn't really get into too much in the episode. One of the things that procedural generation allows small teams to do is to generate outsized returns. So for example, a couple weeks ago, I went to see the art director for No Man's Sky, a guy named Grant Duncan, and he gave this amazing talk about balancing the need for this sort of bespoke, um, sort of hand-painted feel for a game like No Man's Sky against the reality of having to do that for 18 quintillion different worlds. They talked a lot about all the different tools that Hello Games had um, created for art directors like him to be able to, to sort of like manage that balance. So again, it's like you wouldn't be able to do this without procedural generation. So it does make me really excited for all the new ways that small teams will be able to create big game experiences. Ash Gweep makes an excellent point, which is that procedural generation as a genre doesn't work in games in which the strategic element or the strategy that you basically use for the game is tied directly to something consistent, like the map. So MOBAs, for example, a game like League of Legends, your entire team strategy is tied up of an understanding of the game board and the playing field. Um, sports works exactly the same. The soccer pitch is exactly the same from match to match. Um, baseball diamonds are exactly the same from game to game. So yeah, there are some places where uh, having procedural generated worlds wouldn't necessarily work quite as well. 